is very well known in this community and for a variety of exciting papers, and Paul's location being one of them. So this is also a work of his that has been implemented and widely used in practice. So Eric got his PhD from Harvard on the Susan Athey, Elros, and David Parks. And before that, so this is exciting to me personally, so he was a Marshall Scholar at the University of Oxford, working with Paul Clemper, and I believe he got an award for his infant dissertation there. Okay. <laughs> right, so, actually. Okay, so today Eric is going to talk about his recent exciting work on financial markets. And yeah, I'm going to there's some kind of feedback, I think, from my microphones. Is, is this, uh, can you hear me okay now? Is there, if there's feedback, let me know. Um, all right, well, th thank you very much for the, the nice introduction and for re remembering my distinguished master's thesis prize. That was, that's one I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, it was a good thesis. Um, but I'm really excited to be here with this, with this community to share uh, my work on high frequency trading and the design of financial exchanges. I think my, my work on uh, matching and the multi-unit assignment problem and the implementation of our course allocation system at Wharton might be a bit better, better known of, among this community, but I think this is my best work over the last uh, 10 years and I'm really excited to, to share it with you. I also want to just acknowledge uh, my, um, it, one of my dissertation advisors and mentors, uh, David Parks, who's been a real, um, a real mentor to me and also a real ambassador for this interface between economics and computer science, which I personally find so exciting and so invigorating. I think there's a lot of, a lot of intellectual arbitrage and just exciting work to be done uh, at this interface. So thank you for this invitation. It's, it's a real thrill. Um, so I've followed the stock market uh, since I was a little kid. Uh, I remember viscerally as a nine-year-old uh, debating with my father on Tuesday, October 20th, so the morning after Black Monday, uh, whether the market would go up or down that day. I said it was going to go up. I said he should buy shares in IBM, so I guess I was a young econ CS guy. Um, but the first serious idea I came across uh, about financial markets, and I imagine this is the first serious idea many of you have come across about financial markets, uh, was the efficient, efficient markets hypothesis. So Gene Fama, a senior distinguished colleague at the University of Chicago, um, famously distinguished between three forms of the efficient markets hypothesis, what he called the weak form, the semi-strong form, and the strong form. He wrote that efficient markets is obviously an extreme hypothesis. We don't expect it to be literally true, but what we should try to do is pinpoint the level of information at which the hypothesis brings down, uh, breaks down. Rather. The, the weak form of the hypothesis says that you, you can't beat the market, so make risk-adjusted excess returns using just past prices as your information set. The semi-strong form says you can't beat the market using both past prices and other forms of public information, like company news, earnings releases, uh, and so forth as your information set. And the strong form says you can't beat the market, period, even using private information. And what Fama concluded 50 years ago um, was that there was evidence against the strong form. Of course, you can make money if you know something the rest of the market genuinely doesn't know, but that the weak and semi-strong forms held up pretty well on the data. Um, so the plain English is to, the translation is to, to beat the market, you have to know something the rest of the market doesn't know. So as a nine-year-old, I didn't have, have in good information on whether or not to buy IBM on October 20th, although it did go up by like 12 points. Uh, so our, our modern understanding of efficient markets theory, and this is as summarized by the 2013 Nobel Committee, is that stock prices are, quote, next to impossible to predict in the short run but that there's meaningful predictability in markets uh, in the longer run. For instance, using the market's price earnings ratio uh, or by buying value stocks. The, the main debate in this literature is over how to interpret this uh, predictability. To what, to what extent does it affect, uh, reflect purely rational forces like variations in risk that we don't fully understand but that are con consistent with market efficiency? And to what extent does it reflect behavioral biases? So think of this as the pharma versus uh, Schiller debate. But that the market's hard to beat in the short run is still relatively uncontroversial within, uh, within the academic community. The Nobel Committee even wrote that such a situation would reflect a rather basic malfunctioning of the market mechanism. So in 2010, 
a company called Spread Networks invested 300 million bucks to dig a high-speed fiber optic uh, cable uh, between markets in New York and markets in Chicago. And the salient feature of this cable is that it was dug in a straight line. So previous cables had zigzagged along railroad tracks, around mountains, and so forth. And the, the straightness of this cable shaved round trip transmission, uh, data transmission time between markets by three milliseconds, so by three thousandths of a second. Um, it's roughly a hundredth of the time it takes to blink your eye. Uh, industry observers describe three milliseconds as an eternity. They joked at the time that the next innovation would be to dig a tunnel, so go through the earth rather than around the earth to go even faster. And this joke kind of came true. So no one literally dug a tunnel, but microwaves are a different way to get a quote unquote straighter line between Chicago and New York because light travels faster through air uh, than it does through glass. Um, so when I, when I first read about this cable, and I still remember it uh, uh, quite, uh, quite viscerally, I, I really didn't understand it. It was pretty obvious that there was an arms race for speed, but what, what I didn't understand, what wasn't obvious to me at the time, and, and forgive me if this makes me ignorant, was what the speed was for. And the, and the reason it was confusing to me was that three milliseconds is too short to be about fundamentals, when I mean, companies release earnings uh, once a quarter, and economists are dismissive of uh, technical trading strategies. So fish, my efficient markets hat said that purely technical trading strategies um, couldn't, couldn't be profitable. You know, when economists hear phrases like 200-day moving averages or support points, they kind of roll their eyes. So my collaborators, so Peter Crampton, who's here, and many of you know, and John Shim, who's a graduate student at Chicago, who'll be on the market this year. Uh, and I tried to make sense of this race for speed among high-frequency trading firms from the perspective of market design. And what, what do I mean by this? Well, we assume that if participants in markets are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on tiny fractions of seconds, there's some rational reason uh, to do so. Uh, but we wanted to take seriously the possibility that the market rules themselves uh, were suboptimal, that the market rules themselves were flawed. And we wanted to do so at a quite detailed uh, level, because it's often seemingly unimportant details of markets, as this community knows all too well, that end up having a dramatic effect on uh, market performance. Al Roth calls this economic engineering. I'll note as a Chicago guy that even Milton Friedman talked about the importance of getting uh, the quote rules of the game right before then letting uh, market competition uh, do the rest of the work. And, and indeed, our research identified a simple structural flaw in the design of modern uh, financial exchanges. And it's kind of a computer science operations researchy kind of flaw. The flaw is that exchange computers treat time as a continuous variable and process messages serially. So they process messages one at a time uh, in order of receipt. Uh, essentially, when, when financial markets transitioned from human-based trading uh, to electronic trading over the last few decades, and on the whole, this transition has been a great thing for markets, uh, we made a mistake and forgot to tell the computers to put, uh, to put time into units. This combination of continuous time and serial processing causes a violation of the efficient markets hypothesis to be built in directly to the market design. So in an efficient market, to make money, you either have to take risk or know something the rest of the market doesn't know, so have private information. But what our research shows is that built in to the current market design are profitable arbitrage opportunities that are both riskless and use only symmetric public information. So information revealed to the whole market at the same time with the economically obvious implications. So I, I just want to underscore this. There's a, a violation of the efficient markets hypothesis caused by bad market, uh, flawed market design. Um, these arbitrage opportunities aren't supposed to exist in a well-designed market. Um, and they, make market, they harm markets in two ways. They make markets less liquid, and they in, uh, induce a socially wasteful, never-ending uh, race for speed. Our paper then proposes a, an alternative market design uh, in which time is uh, put into, into discrete units. And the unit, for the purpose of this talk, think of the unit as a millisecond or a tenth of a second, some very small, small amount of time. I'll be a little bit more precise about this uh, later in the, in the talk. If multiple trade requests arrive at the, quote, same time, then award the trade to whoever offers the best price, not whoever was fastest. So just run, run a little mini uh, auction. 
And this market design called frequent batch auctions directly addresses the problem with continuous markets. It fixes the failure of the efficient markets hypothesis, and in doing so improves liquidity uh, and stops, uh, stops a socially wasteful arms race. I'll also argue that it has uh, meaningful computational simplicity benefits uh, for the market. So the, the plan for the talk is I want to spend the first half of the talk going through this work with Crampton and Shim uh, in some detail. I'll go over some new empirical facts about how markets behave at high frequency time horizons. I'll give you a theoretical model uh, that helps isolate the core flaw with the current uh, market design, and then I'll show how going from continuous to discrete, from continuous serial to discrete batch, uh, directly fixes the problem. I'll then organize the second half of the talk around the main question we've been getting about this research over the last several years, which is will the market fix the market? Is this a problem that will be fixed by private market forces, or would some kind of regulatory uh, in intervention be necessary uh, to fix, uh, fix the problems? And for this, I'll talk briefly about some new work uh, with uh, Robin Lee and John Shim. It's work that's very much uh, still in progress. And in the, in the last few minutes of the talk, I'll make a few broader remarks about what, what's really been an unusual few years. This is a, this is a paper that uh, got a lot of attention from industry and regulators, some quite positive, some quite uh, caustic. I was as an untenured guy thrown into the lion's den a few times. Um, and I'll, I'll make a few re reflections on, 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 this, uh, on this experience and I think some lessons for market design and, and academic research uh, more, more broadly. Okay, so let me get into the paper with Crampton and Shim. So first, just so we're all on the same page, one slide on what, what is the current market design. Uh, it's called the Continuous Limit Order Book. Uh, the basic building blocks a limit order. It specifies a price, quantity, and a direction. And traders can submit limit orders to the market at any moment in time during, during the day. They can cancel orders at any moment in time uh, during the day. Um, these orders and cancellations are processed by the exchange one at a time in order of receipt. That is, as a, as a continuous time a serial process. And trade occurs whenever a new order arrives that's either larger than a currently outstanding offer to sell or, uh, or vice versa. And the data we use is roughly speaking a play-by-play -play of the continuous uh, limit order book. So I want to begin with some empirical facts that show that continuous markets don't work as you might expect uh, in, in continuous time at high frequency uh, trading time horizons. So this is a plot of the price paths uh, over the course of a trading day for the two most highly traded, uh, li or really most liquid financial instruments that track uh, the S&P 500 index, uh, the E-mini futures contract that trades uh, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the Spider exchange traded fund that trades on the various uh, U.S. equities exchanges. We have millisecond level direct feed data, so millisecond by millisecond level play-by-play uh, 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 -play of the market. And what this, what this sh uh, graph shows is um, over the course of a trading day, the, the midpoints of the, uh, the, the prices of these two assets moving, uh, you know, moving quite dramatically. We picked a volatile trading day for the slide, but it's uh, moving in a quite correlated uh, manner, as we'd expect. They're tracking the same index. Uh, here's an hour of data. Here's a minute of data. And then here's what the market starts to look like when you zoom into high frequencies. This is a quarter of a second, 250 millisecond slice of the day. And when you zoom into high frequency, the correlation between assets falls apart. Uh, the correlation is basically one between these assets, you know, an excess of 0.99 at a minute or an hour or a day. Uh, at, at a millisecond, the correlation is basically zero. And it's under 0.01. It doesn't really matter how you adjust for relativity. Uh, the correlation uh, falls apart. And the reason this phenomenon matters is that it creates obvious mechanical arbitrage opportunities. So for example, in this picture, when the, when the blue line jumps, buy the green line. So when the price in Chicago jumps, uh, buy, uh, buy in New York. Now the usual efficient markets hypothesis story with obvious mechanical arbitrage opportunities is that once they're discovered, market forces will compete them away. But I want to show you that that's not quite what happens, uh, what happens here because of the market design. So we do find that the durations of arbitrage opportunities uh, come way down over, over the duration of our data. So our data covers the period 2005 to 2011. Um, the profits per arbitrage opportunity, on the other hand, are pretty stable uh, over time. You see a slight uptick during the financial crisis, but otherwise you know, reasonably stable per, per arbitrage opportunity. 
The frequency of arbitrage opportunities does fluctuate uh, meaningfully over time, but this, this variation is mostly driven by changes in market volatility, which if you think about it, it makes sense. The more markets are jumping around, the more mispricings there are, the more, more arbitrage opportunities there are uh, to take advantage of. And this figure is a complementary way of thinking about the same phenomenon. On the right-hand side of the graph, you see the correlation between these markets at 100 milliseconds. And you see that this correlation getting higher and higher and higher in each year of our data. This is information from Chicago markets making it into New York markets faster and, you know, and vice versa. But on the left-hand side of the graph, you see that in, almost all, in, in all of the years, at high enough frequency, the correlation falls apart. And this is ex post kind of obvious. Right? There's nothing keeping these market prices tied together exactly in continuous time. So, so just to summarize, uh, competition has raised the bar for how fast you have to be to capture arbitrage opportunities. The durations have come way down. But competition has not, in the data, eliminated the arbitrage opportunities reduce their size. Now, this suggests, and I'll formalize this in the theory, that we might want to think of uh, latency arbitrage opportunities as something like, a, and, and the arms race is something like a constant of the market design. I'll, I'll, come back, uh, I'll come back to this explicitly in the theory. So in, in our data, this one trade, uh, uh, S&P 500 index arbitrage, is worth about 75 million bucks per year. Uh, and we think this is a, a meaningful underestimate, both because we're reasonably conservative on how we treat transactions costs, and we're also conservative with how we handle a, a data issue with respect to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange that I, I won't get into, but that we, we emphasize in the paper. But more important to mention is that ES SPY is just, the, it's just one trade. It's the tip of the iceberg uh, in, the race, uh, in the race for speed. This is where we could, we could get good data that was at fine granularity relative to the duration of the arms race uh, at the time. Uh, but conceptually, all continuous electronic markets around the world are similar. There's lots of highly correlated uh, instruments and nothing in the market architecture to enable prices to move at exactly uh, the same time. So here's, here's treasury bonds, uh, here's other equity indices, uh, currency pairs, uh, precious metals, uh, uh, oil and gas. In honor of last night's speaker, I've got Bitcoin versus Ethereum. This is from December, a day in December 2017. Um, uh, here's a, just a, lo a long list of obviously uh, correlated pairs that uh, John, uh, John Shim and I wrote down with, with not too much effort. Um, in U.S. equities markets, there are arbitrage trades that are even simpler because the same stock trades on 13 different exchanges and 50 different uh, dark pools. These arbitrages were the, the subject of the Michael Lewis book. Uh, Flash Boys, there's a race to re react to publicly disseminated uh, news like, Mich like the Michigan Consumer Confidence Number, that was the subject of the New York Attorney General's initial interest uh, in this space. Um, there are, I, I don't think it's possible, given the data that's available to date, to put a precise estimate on the total size of the prize at stake in the speed race, but common sense extrapolation from our ES spy estimates and from the other data that's been academically um, from other, other numbers academics have, have been able to find in other uh, corners of the speed race suggest that the sums are, are meaningful. They're e easily single digit uh, billions uh, per year in US equities. Michael Lewis's book reports a number that's $20 billion a year in, per year in US equities. It, it's hard to get to that from the, the data that's academically uh, available. Um, if you extrapolate from U.S. equities to all financial markets, so futures markets, currency markets, uh, both U.S. and abroad, it's pretty easy to get to numbers in excess of $10 billion uh, per year. And if you take a net present value of that, it's pretty easy to get to in excess of $100 billion of, of net present value at stake. Um, I don't think this is the number one policy problem in finance, just to be clear, but it's a, it's a meaningful problem and it's worth, uh, worth trying to solve. So I now want to go on to the, the theory model, and this is a theoretical critique of the current uh, market design. So the model is really quite, uh, quite simple. Um, it's a descendant of the famous Glaston-Milgram model, and it's also quite teachable. So I'll go over, it, I'll go over the setup, at least, in uh, some detail with the hopes that you can build on it and or, uh, and or teach it. And I think the model will show in a quite transparent way that arbitrages are built into the market design. Okay, there's a security, I want to call it X, that trades on a continuous limit order book market. There's a public signal, call it Y, 
that jumps around as a, a compound Poisson jump process. And the, dish, the, the frequency of jumps is a la denoted lambda jump, and the size of jumps is distributed uh, uh, capital J. Uh, and I want to make a purposefully strong assumption, which is that X is just worth Y. X is perfectly correlated to this public signal Y. X can always be cautiously liquidated at, the, at this fundamental value. And, and the goal of this assumption is to create a best case scenario for price discovery and liquidity provision uh, in, a continuous, uh, in a continuous market, shutting down uh, asymmetric information, shutting down inventory costs, essentially shutting down the traditional sources of costly liquidity provision that have been emphasized uh, in the literature. There's two kinds of players in our model, investors and trading firms. Uh, investors are going to act pretty mechanically. They show up uh, to market in a Poisson process at rate uh, lambda invest. Uh, and they need to buy or sell one unit of X, uh, you know, 50, equally likely to need to buy versus sell. We think of investors as representing end users of uh, financial markets. And then the, the second kind of player is trading firms, or we could call them high frequency traders or, or market, uh, market participants, a couple different terms you could use for them. Um, they're always present in the market. Their goal is to buy low and sell high. And, and vice versa, they don't have an intrinsic demand to own, uh, own X. Their, their goal is just to, ma is to make profits from, uh, from participating in the market. Initially, I'm going to assume that there are exogenously uh, N trading firms present in the market, and then later I'll endogenize, uh, endogenize their entry. So initially, I want to assume away all sources of latency. Um, so when Y changes, all market participants see this immediately, can act on this immediately, no latency in interacting with the exchange. Um, uh, and again, I'm trying to create a best case scenario for, for the continuous market to try to isolate the core, uh, core market design problem. I'll add latency uh, in, a, in a few moments when we endogenize en entry. Okay, so given the setup of this model with, with no asymmetric information, no inventory costs, no latency, and so forth, you might conjecture that competition among trading firms is going to lead to effectively infinite liquidity for investors. That is, you might expect trading firms to be willing to offer to buy, buy or sell X at, at Y um, in, you know, in an unlimited quantity. There's, there's no, no asymmetric information, no inventory costs. We've turned off the usual sources of cost of liquidity provision. But that's not what's going to happen due to an issue with the market design that we call, uh, call sniping. Okay, so suppose that Y jumps from, say, Y1 to Y2. And think of this as the moment at which the correlation between assets very momentarily uh, breaks down. If I'm a trading firm making markets uh, in, in X, I'm, I'm providing bids and asks in the market for X, and Y jumps, I'm going to send a message to the exchange to cancel my quotes for X uh, at the old price and replace them with quotes for X at, at the price that reflects the new, uh, the new information. At the exact same time, other trading firms are going to send messages to the exchange attempting to snipe my stale quotes, attempting to trade against my stale quotes before I can get the heck uh, out of the way. And since the market processes these, message, these messages serially in, in continuous time, um, it's possible that one of your messages to snipe my stale quote will, reach, will get processed by the market before my message to cancel my stale quote and, and get out of the way. And it's not only possible, but probable. Because if there's N respondents to some piece of information, the likelihood that any one liquidity provider can get out of the way, uh, if there's N minus one guys trying to snipe them, is, is one out of N. Okay. So I've been doing this thing with my hands for a few years now. Here it is uh, in graphics for the purpose of larger audience talks. And here's, here's a Y, there's a jump. If you're trading for making a market in, in X, you're going to cancel your old quotes, replace them with new quotes. At the same time, other trading firms are going to try to snipe your steal quote, in this case, the, the ask. And it's, it's just random which of that burst of activity is going to get to interact with the steal price, my attempt to cancel or your attempt to, uh, to snipe me. So in the continuous market, even symmetrically observed public information, information observed by the whole market at the same time responding with the exact same technology uh, earns, uh, earns arbitrage rents. Uh, and I want to underscore again, that's it's just not supposed to happen in an efficient market. Symmetric public information is supposed to get into market prices for free. Um, and asset prices are supposed to be hard to predict in a profitable way uh, in, the, in the short run. 
In equilibrium, these, these arbitrage profits, these arbitrage rents are ultimately going to get paid by in investors in the form of more costly liquidity. So there's some details of the equilibrium analysis that I, I'm going to skip uh, in the interest of time, but the, the basic intuition is pretty simple once you get the idea of, of sniping. Um, in equilibrium, trading firms are going to be indifferent between liquidity provision uh, and, and sniping. Liquidity provision earns revenues from providing liquidity at a bid-ask spread when investors show up and either buy at the ask or sell at the bid. And it, it, it suffers costs when, when there's news and you're, and you're not first to react when you get, uh, get sniped. Sniping has benefits when jumps occur. Uh, and, in the, and these mathematical expressions, notice that the cost to every one liquidity provider uh, from, pro um, from providing liquidity that has an n minus one over n term at, at the end, and that's just the sum of the benefits to the snipers, their n minus one snipers trying to snipe them. Uh, it's a zero sum transfer between uh, snipers and liquidity providers, if you will. Uh, making trading firms indifferent between these two activities yields an equation that characterizes the equilibrium spread, the equilibrium cost of liquidity for investors. Um, and what it says is that the profits trading firms earn from sniping uh, is an expense borne by trading firms providing liquidity who then earn that back by charging a wider than necessary uh, bid-ask spread, charging more for that liquidity to end investors. Okay, now let's endogenize uh, entry. I'm going to do this again in a, in a simple way. I'm going to assume that all, all participants have access to a slow speed technology that observes innovations in Y with latency delta slow for free. Or you can pay a small a, a fee, a, a price to get um, access to a faster speed technology that observes innovations uh, with a faster latency of, of delta, delta fast. So think of delta slow as the old cable, delta fast as microwaves, or delta fast as old micro, delta slow as old microwaves, delta fast as new microwaves, or delta fast as having co-location or proprietary data feeds from exchanges, uh, and so forth. So equilibrium similar to above, it's now characterized by two equations. The first is the one from earlier that leaves trading firms indifferent between uh, liquidity provision uh, and, and stale quote sniping. Uh, and the second equation is a, is a free entry condition that says that uh, the amount of entry is going to dissipate the profits, uh, profits from the speed race. And, this, the, the, what this, and these two conditions together yield a, one, a new equation that I displayed on the slide. And this new equation says that, in words, that the revenues uh, from stale quote sniping get dissipated by investment in speed. So the, the prize in the arms race, expenditure on speed, and the, and the cost to investors in the form of excess, uh, excessively costly liquidity uh, are all equivalent uh, in the model. So I'm a Chicago economist. I get asked by my colleagues and I ask myself, you know, what, what exactly is going wrong here? What's the market failure? Why isn't the race for speed just a form of healthy, uh, healthy market competition? And this paper is really a tale of two market failures. The first market failure is, is sniping, is rents from symmetric public information. These aren't supposed to exist. They, to quote the Nobel Committee, represent a malfunctioning of the market system. Uh, and the second market failure is that these sniping rents then induce a, an arms race, which is mathematically equivalent uh, to a, a prisoner's dilemma. High frequency trading firms would be mutually better off if they could collectively disarm, if they could collectively agree to stop investing um, uh, in, in, in new speed technology, but that's, that's not an equilibrium. Okay, a couple of remarks about the model. Um, so one is the role of high frequency traders. So in the model, uh, high frequency traders, uh, let me just restart. So the model does not say that high frequency traders are bad for markets. Rather, what it says is that high frequency traders are endogenously going to perform uh, two functions for markets. Uh, one is they're going to engage in liquidity provision, discovering prices, providing liquidity to end investors. And the other is that they're going to try to snipe stale quotes. And the first of these functions is useful for investors, and the second of these functions is harmful to investors. Um, and I, I underscore, don't be misled by the fact that sniping looks like HFT on HFT combat. That misses the economics. The economics are that a, a sniping is a tax on liquidity provision, and that's costly uh, for investors. And the second remark is, if you'll notice, the, the size of the prize in the arms race 
the delta terms, or the, the, the magnitude of speed improvements, and the C term, the cost of speed improvements, didn't show up anywhere. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about speed improvements measured in seconds, or measured in tenths of seconds, or measured in nanoseconds. It doesn't matter whether speed improvements cost $300 million, a billion dollars, or a million dollars. Um, um, if the speed technology is cheap, there'll be a lot of entry. If the speed technology is expensive, there'll be a small amount of entry. Of, of entry. Um, the, what this tells us is that the arms race and the harm to investors is an equilibrium uh, feature of the market design. We're gonna, it's going to keep going as long as we have, uh, have this market design. And with, with this, let me give you some highlights of the arms race for speed since we started this, this research. So I mentioned um, that microwaves are faster at transmitting data than high-speed fiber optic cable. This is a, a graphic of the first microwave network connecting Chicago to New York. It was implemented within about a year of the spread networks cable. It wasn't quite a straight line, but microwaves are, are sufficiently faster than cable that, that it was fast enough. Um, this microwave network starts in downtown Chicago, actually around the corner from Jason Hartline's house, if he's here. Um, so next time, you're, next time you're in Millennium Park, I encourage you to check it out. Um, here's the microwave network in the US filling in over the last six or seven years. So here's 2011, you can start to see it percolate, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, you'll notice that Washington, oh, sorry, you'll, you'll notice that Washington DC is, is in the corner of this triangle. You could think of it as like the latency arbitrage, uh, a triangle, and that's because a lot of symmetric public information emanates from Washington DC. So like when the Fed makes an announcement or when, when jobs numbers come out, the, the location of that server, by the way, is, is literally on, on K Street. You can't, can't make that up. Uh, this is FCC microwave license data. It's, it's, it's hard to, we, I didn't do the work to track down who, who owns which one. Um, you, can, you can partially trace it, but uh, I can point you to the data set after the talk if, if, if it would be helpful. Um, here's a microwave link being built between Chicago and Seattle. It's probably done by now. You might wonder what Seattle has to do with financial markets. It's not Amazon. It's that, that's the straight line from Chicago uh, to Tokyo. Um, and here's a, I, I guess that's funny, all right. <laughs> I find it disheartening, but um, here's a sign from, a, from an industry conference. Uh, the tagline is, uh, nanoseconds matter, it's a hardware switch. Um, a nanosecond is, you know, every time you blink your eye, 400 million nanoseconds have passed. Like, the fact that nanoseconds matter uh, should tell you something. Okay, so I now want to explain why um, uh, our, new, our proposed new market design, frequent batch auctions, and how this directly, uh, directly solves the problem. So at a high level, our proposal is to make two changes to the current market design. Uh, turn, put time into discrete units, and then batch process messages that arrive at the same discrete time interval and batch process using an auction rather than processing serially via the limit order book. A little, a little bit more precisely, here's, here's the proposed, uh, proposed market. So there's a batch interval, we'll call it tau. For the purpose of this talk, let's think of tau as, as a millisecond. There's arguments for making it meaningfully longer, you know, a few orders of magnitude longer, like a tenth of a second or a second. I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But I think to, to explain the market design, think of it as an amount of time that's long for a computer, but otherwise pretty damn fast. Um, during the batch interval, um, traders submit bids and asks, so limit orders, just, just like in, this, in, the, in current practice. They can be freely modified, canceled, et cetera. If an order isn't executed in one batch interval, it remains outstanding to the next batch interval and the next and the next until it's either uh, executed or canceled, again, just like standard, uh, standard limit orders. Uh, at the end of each batch interval, the exchange uh, aggregates all outstanding orders, so all orders that have been remaining in the market from previous intervals and orders that are new, uh, new this interval, aggregates supply and demand and figures out whether they cross or not. Um, if supply and demand don't cross, the no trade happens and orders just carry forward to the, next, uh, to the next millisecond, to the next interval. If supply and demand do cross, um, then transactions occur at a market clearing price. So the, the market, uh, mar proposed market uh, auction design is the uniform uh, price auction, just like we use in treasury markets, for example. Uh, priority is still price than time, but treating, treating time as discrete. So what this means is that 
if my order has been in hanging out in the market for many intervals and your order is new this interval and we're at the same price, my order has priority over yours. But if our orders arrive in the same interval at the same price, we have uh, the same priority. And if necessary to break ties, just do so in some uh, random fashion, such as a pro rata or random tie breaking. Um, the information policy is that the same information is disseminated as in the continuous market. It's just disseminated in discrete time. Again, we're thinking of, think of it as putting time into discrete units. So trades, outstanding uh, orders, cancels, and so forth. That, all of that information is disseminated in, in discrete uh, time. This is an important detail to underscore. You wouldn't want to disseminate information about what's going on in the batch interval during the batch interval. Disseminate information in discrete time at the end of each, uh, at the end of each batch auction. To, so to explain how and why frequent batch auctions work, I want to go over three, uh, three cases. In some sense, are redundant to what I've just explained, but, but I think it helps clarify. So the first case is that in a batch interval, nothing really happens. And this is, you know, even for the most active symbol, and we think of financial markets as extremely high frequency, but most of the time, in most symbols, nothing's happening. So for, like, for Google stock, for example, and Google's a pretty high, high market capitalization, high, mar high volume stock in the scheme of things, there's activity in less than 0.5% of all milliseconds and trade in less than about 0.1% of all milliseconds. So if, if in a millisecond nothing happens, then there's orders to, to sell, there's orders to buy, and they just kind of flash uh, from one millisecond to the next while, while nothing's happening. And this is just like displayed liquidity uh, in, in a limit order book uh, market. The bottom of the supply curves, the ask, the top of the demand curves, the bid. A second case is a small amount of trade happens. So an investor shows up and buys 100 shares uh, of Google, for example. Um, and this case, too, is just like in current practice. You know, investors can, quote, buy at the ask or sell at the bid, just like in a continuous market. Uh, the third case is that there's a burst of activity uh, in the interval, so likely in response to some information signal, so some jump in, jump in Y in the language of the model. And this case is where discrete time and continuous time are meaningfully different. So there's two reasons. So the first and kind of more obvious reason is that discrete time reduces the economic relevance of tiny speed advantages. So as long as the batch interval is long relative to the, the speed advantages at play, so relative to the difference in speed between fast guys and slow guys, and don't think of fast and slow as like high frequency traders and your grandma. Think of fast and slow as like high frequency traders and other extremely sophisticated financial market participants who aren't at the very, uh, very cutting edge of speed. Uh, then you know, most information is going to arrive at a point in the batch interval um, at which all participants can see the information and act on it, or no participants can see the information in time for this interval uh, and act on it. There's only a tiny sliver of the, of the interval of proportion delta over tau at which the, a delta speed advantage is relevant if the batch interval is tau. The second and more subtle reason is that the auction changes the, the nature of competition. Uh, and instead of competing on speed, trading firms compete uh, on price. And the easiest way to see this is to suppose that a piece of public information actually does arrive during this critical window, during this delta over tau uh, window, and there are some slow traders with stale quotes in the book. Uh, in the continuous market, this is going to lead to a race to snipe by fast traders to snipe the stale quotes, whereas in the discrete auction market, fast traders are going to compete on price for the right to trade with you. So if the information is truly public and obvious, the auction is going to compete away rents um, uh, and compete away, compete away the uh, arbitrage profits. OK, so I'm going to skip the, the details of the equilibrium analysis just in the interest of time and just give you, give you the, the takeaway. So if we treat the number of high frequency trading firms as exogenous, again, and just like in the study of the continuous market, we had an exogenous entry case and an endogenous entry case. If we treat the number of trading firms as exogenous, and this is probably the right way of thinking about like an initial pilot test or a small entrant as opposed to a market-wide uh, reform, then frequent batch auctions eliminate sniping mathematically for any tau, so for any tau greater than zero. So mathematically, there's a discontinuity as you go from continuous serial to discrete batch. A little bit more practically, I think of any tau as meaning tau long enough to genuinely batch process if multiple sophisticated participants respond to the same piece of information with the same technology at you know, roughly the same time. 
Uh, so that might, a millisecond's probably plenty to genuinely, uh, genuinely batch process. If we treat the number of high frequency trading firms as endogenous, and this is the relevant case for thinking about a, a market wide reform aimed at stopping the, uh, the wasteful speed race, then, then the equilibrium analysis says the interval has to be long relative to the speed advantages in play, so re relative to the delta. And we do a, a rough calibration in the paper. Um, and given the scale of the modern speed race, a, a magnitude of a tenth of a second, give or take a few orders of magnitude, uh, seems plenty to, uh, to, to significantly dampen down the, the speed race. So the main theoretical arguments in the paper for discrete time batching are it eliminates sniping, stops, uh, uh, stops the arms race, um, uh, enhances, enhances liquidity. We also conjecture, and I think this, I, I want to spend a, a few minutes on this with this audience in particular, uh, that discrete time has significant computational advantages uh, over continuous time trading. And the basic observation is that computers and communications technology are really fast, but not infinitely fast. And continuous time markets sometimes implicitly assume in funny ways that communications and computers are infinitely, uh, infinitely fast, whereas discrete time respects computational uh, limits. So let me give a, a few specific examples, again, in the hope of sparking uh, interest in this topic of computational simplicity. So, so one example is for exchanges. So in continuous time, exchanges face a mathematically impossible task, which is to process messages in real time you know, instantaneously. Even you know, processing any one message is computationally trivial, but even computationally trivial stuff takes non-zero uh, non-zero time. And this means that when a lot of participants are trying to do stuff at the same time, so in times of economic duress, for example, exchanges are going to get backlogged. So this is a graph of exchange backlog by, of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange during the October 2014 uh, U.S. Treasury market flash crash. Uh, and at the, peak of, at the peak of this event, the CME was backlogged for about 60 milliseconds. So on the one hand, you can say, like, that's pretty good for, for a tail event to be backlogged by 60 milliseconds, like that's not too, too shabby. But this backlog helped contribute to the flash crash. It sowed significant uh, confusion among investors and regulators. US treasuries are supposed to be pretty stable. Um, discrete time, of course, solves this problem. A little bit more precisely, discrete time makes a realistic promise to market participants, which is you'll know by next interval what happened this interval. Um, there have been a lot of glitches at exchanges. Let me not dwell, dwell on that. Um, discrete time gives, compu gives exchanges some flexibility to do uh, richer, to accommodate richer forms of preference expression. This is something I'm, I'm quite excited about. It's work in progress with Peter and with uh, Pete Kyle and, and David Parks and Mina Lee and David Malik. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out to what extent we can use discrete time uh, to accommodate richer forms of preference expression. Um, and we'll, just stay tuned. Um, for algorithmic traders, um, in continuous markets, there's an intrinsic trade-off between speed and code robustness. You know, every line of code, every bit of error checking takes, uh, takes time. And the kind of code that high-frequency traders write to optimize for speed is very different from the kind of code they'd write with even a little bit more breathing room. And this trade-off between speed and smarts is, again, substantially muted if you go from continuous time to discrete time. If the batch interval is a millisecond, then you know, the first millisecond worth of smarts doesn't cost you anything. Whereas in continuous time, like every nanosecond matters, as you saw. Uh, for regulators, so think about a regulator surveilling the market's paper trail, um, or an investor trying to understand the market's paper trail uh, to figure out whether they got, to assess whether they got best execution. In a continuous market, this is complicated because you have to think about relativity, you, think you have to think about clock noise. So the question of like, did this event in market A happen before or after this event in market B is complicated. In discrete time, that's simple. I mean, that, that, that's only complicated because of design choices. Um, so there have been a lot of alternative responses to the high-frequency trading uh, arms race discussed over the last few years. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this now, the, the, I'll mention two things briefly. So one is that the bands of high frequency trading that have been proposed seem to just misunderstand cause and effect. They seem like economically uh, misguided ideas. 
Um, and the second is that my thoughts on IEX's market design are, are fairly nuanced. And if you're interested, please look at, I wrote a detailed comment letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission that's on my website if you're interested uh, in that topic. Okay, so to summarize Budish, Crampton, and Shim, you know, we look at the HFT arms race from the perspective of market design. The root problem isn't evil high frequency traders, it's a, it's a glitch. Continuous time serial process trading. This glitch causes a built-in failure of the efficient markets hypothesis. It's simple to fix by moving to a discrete time uh, batch process market design, which would eliminate sniping, uh, enhance liquidity, stop the arms race, and simplify the market uh, computationally. So what's been the response to this paper since we released it? So we released this paper in the summer of 2013 it pretty quickly took on a life of its, its own, which I guess may not be surprising in retrospect, but was surprising at the time. Um, one, one response that it got was from the New York Attorney General's office. He noted, among other things, that as a University of Chicago economist, you know, we're not enemies of free markets, which I, of course, uh, agree with. You know, Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs uh, seem to like the, the idea. Uh, this is my favorite compliment for the, for the Oh, sorry, this is, I'm out of order. This is a, my, my, the full spectrum of my, uh, ideological spectrum of my colleagues seem to like it, so that was, that was nice. Th this was my, my favorite compliment. That was Cliff Asnes, the founder, uh, founder of AQR. And, and this is, be a, lot of the, a lot of the response to the work was actually quite caustic. I got called communist a lot. And I'm an economist at the University of Chicago talking about auctions in financial markets, not like crypto financial markets, actual, you know, <laughs> real, like the stock issue. But uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a communist. Um, but by, by far the most common question we got um, was, you know, the, the modal response was, like, oh, this seems right, but how do we get from here to there? Is this a problem the market's going to solve on its own? Would some kind of regulatory intervention be needed? If a regulatory intervention would be needed, do we trust that the regulators will get the details right? That's kind of where the communist allegations come from. So what I'll do, I, I don't have too, too much time, but I, I wanna advertise some new work that tries to shed light on this, on this question, and then I'll make a few, uh, a few closing remarks. So to, to frame the new work, here's a quote from the Securities and Exchange Chair um, Securities and Exchange Commission Chair um, uh, Mary Jo White from a speech she gave on equity market structure uh, a few summers ago. She first acknowledges the arms race for speed. She then says she's wary of prescriptive regulation, re with a reasonable stance. Uh, she then says she's open to exchanges innovating on market design, including trying out frequent batch auctions. And last, and this is kind of the part I want to underscore, is she says that the SEC's job as a market re regulator is effectively to avoid inadvertently getting in the way of, of useful innovation. And the implicit presumption is that market forces will fix meaningful market design uh, problems. Um, the market will, will fix the market. And this is kind of a natural instinct. It's certainly the leading case in economics that if there's a meaningful inefficiency in the world and private firms have the capacity to solve that inefficiency, that, that incentives, the private and social incentives align. But it's not the only case, as, as, I, think, as I think we all, as we all know. Um, and the goal of this paper is to understand what are the private versus social incentives for exchanges to innovate on market design and do they align or uh, diverge. Will, will market forces fix the market? So the first part of the paper tries to build a, a, a theoretical model in, in, this, in the industrial organization tradition of how stock exchanges uh, compete in the, modern, uh, in the modern era. And the second part of the paper then tries to validate that this is a reasonable model um, uh, using a variety of forms of data. And then the third part of the, ta the, the paper says like, okay, given this model of how exchanges compete, let's think about um, what are the incentives for exchanges to adopt a new market design that eliminates sniping and hence attracts, you know, re reduces the cost of liquidity and hence could attract, attract a market share. So I'm gonna skip some of the, these slides. I think I have about like, we started a bit late, but I'll go to like, about 10 more minutes or something, five, 10 more minutes. But I'm gonna skip a lot of these slides. So um, 
we, we take, take the BCS model, we expand it out from one exchange that's passive to many exchanges that are strategic. And they're strategic in two dimensions. Um, they set a, a fee to trade a share of stock, call that little f, and then they, char they set a fee, which we call big F, for, access to, for fast access to their exchange. So I didn't emphasize this a lot in the earlier part of the talk, but exchanges sell a lot of the arms into the arms race. They sell uh, co-location, the right to put your computer next to their computer. Uh, they sell proprietary data feeds, which are faster than the non-proprietary data feeds. We're going to call the price for that um, for that technology, um, big F. So exchanges are strategic, they choose little F and big F, and later they're gonna choose market design. Okay, so skipping through a lot of details. So what does our equilibrium, um, what does our equilibrium suggest? It suggests that essentially exchanges have been dealt a rough hand on the little F business. The, 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 the market, the, the nature of how stock exchanges compete, and the key, the key thing, the key detail to, to emphasize is that on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, search across all of the different exchanges is really quite frictionless. It's really, you should think of it as zero-cost search. Like if you open Uber and you open Lyft to see which is cheaper, you're paying a, a tiny search cost. It might take 30 extra seconds. Think of stock exchanges as you open all exchanges automatically for free and pay zero search cost. That's really economically the right way to think about it. Given that frictionless search, trading fees get competed down to the competitive level, which is essentially zero. But exchanges have market power on the sale of uh, co-location and data. Only NASDAQ can sell NASDAQ-specific co-location, the right to put your computers next to NASDAQ's computer. Okay? And so what our equilibrium highlights is that Exchanges aren't able to make a lot of money from the little F business, trading fees. They are able to make economic profits from the big F business. You might think economically, well, if the big F business is so good, why don't they cut little F even further to get more market share and hence be able to get more revenue from co-location? And the answer is they hit up against a money pump constraint. If you charge a price for trading, for trading that's even lower than zero, then you're going to get a lot of trading. You're going to get a lot of self-dealing effectively, I mean, not in an illegal sense, but you're going to get a lot of trading exploiting the negative fee. So you can't set a fee that's lower than zero without creating issues. Zero is kind of a binding constraint. At zero, little f, exchanges make a lot of money from big f. So you see all that play out in the data. We do, do a lot of data. <laughs> um, so the trading fees for, for stocks uh, and the big three exchange families, they're not quite zero, but they're like 0.01 pennies per share traded. So just to put that in perspective, the entire US equity market's revenue from trading fees is lower than the revenue from my employer, right? Like Chicago Booth, you wouldn't think is larger than New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, BATS, but you know, the, it's, it's just not a very big business. Um, and the, the stock exchanges make relatively little of their money from trading fees as distinct from uh, futures exchanges, which don't face this frictionless search problem, they have, well, more precisely, they have proprietary products that only trade on one exchange, that aren't fungible across lots of different exchanges. Uh, here for fun is a, a, a co-location offerings table from NASDAQ. They're, they're price discriminating at the level of microseconds, so you can spend ec you know, extra money to go from five microsecond of latency in, uh, to three microseconds of, of latency. Um, okay, so what are the incentives for market design innovation that come out of our framework? So first, the good news, which is that if a frequent batch auction exchange were to enter and charge us a zero trading fee, um, you know, reasonable prior might be a coordination problem. If I start bootish rides and compete against Uber, even if I'm a little bit better than Uber in terms of my matching algorithm, none of you all are going to pay attention to it. But in, stock, in U.S. stock exchanges, because of frictionless search that in some sense is regulatorily mandated, if, if there's an exchange that has better liquidity, investors will automatically notice that better liquidity and that helps tip the market to the exchange with the better designs. Actually, in the model, if a frequent batch auction exchange were to enter, um, it would win significant share. I mean, in a stylized model, it wins 100% share. That, you know, you shouldn't take that, that literally. And that, that argument works. Uh, works even if the discrete exchange charges a non-zero uh, charges a non-zero trading fee. Essentially they can charge a fee to get compensated for eliminating sniping. 
The issue is that other exchanges have an incentive to then do exactly the same thing. So if you've got one exchange that innovates on design to, to fix the latency arbitrage problem and then charges a fee to get paid for that, then another exchange, seeing that they're losing share, could fix the latency arbitrage problem, charge a smaller fee, and you can then end up back where you started, competing these fees down towards zero, but now having eliminated the one part of your business that's any good, which is the, the business that's selling co-location and data feeds to latency-sensitive uh, market participants. Okay? So you end up with essentially a prisoner's dilemma, where any one exchange that adopted could actually win significant share and make money if it could do so unilaterally. But then if other exchanges copied, there wouldn't be any money left. You'd, have, you'd be stuck in this world of brutal competition on trading fees, uh, having blown the good part of the business, which is co-location and data. And this might sound a little bit abstract and academic and fanciful, but as the chief economist of NASDAQ in an academic conference, he basically said it would be expensive to adopt frequent batch auctions. We could do it. Technologically, it's easy. The hard part would be getting the SEC to approve it. And if we did it, we'd get copied. So there wouldn't be much economic incentive for us to do it. So, you know, if a, just a, this is a sort of a summary of what I already said. I mean, the, so this analysis doesn't look great for the market fixing the market. But the, one optimistic spin is that zero is not bad because zero is really close to positive. So you, you, you can kind of, you can't squint and see the next Uber in this space. So you, you don't see like a $50 billion market opportunity, but you can see paths to how a, a, a de novo especially might be able to carve out a, a, non, you know, a profitable uh, business. Small private profits, you know, meaningful social value, make the market a lot, uh, a lot better. The least likely innovator is gonna be an a large incumbent that's making a lot of money from co-location and proprietary data. Um, so let me spend, um, the last couple, I'm basically done. So let me try to conclude. Uh, conclude. Um, so the, I think the model, you know, this, as is pretty typical in an economics talk, you spend like 48 minutes talking about some market failure and some solution to some market failure, and then two minutes and say like, oh, regulators should then go fix that problem, and don't spend a lot of time on regulatory incentives. Here the, the the, I think there actually is a simple, there's, a, there's a, a hard regulatory fix and a simple regulatory fix. The hard regulatory fix, which I would personally support, is to adopt, is, is to adopt discrete time in some uh, economically meaningful way. I don't think we have the, the data available to be 100% confident of that recommendation, but given what I, the facts that I have, I, I, would, I would personally favor it. Um, I can give you the details offline to what, what exactly I mean um, uh, by, that, by that proposal, um, you know, it properly def defined, it would fix latency arbitrage, it would stop the speed race, it would dramatically simplify markets. Again, I don't think we have the data to be 100% confident, but I think uh, a, a, propo a, a regulatory reform that put time into tiny units um, and then enforced the meaningfulness of that unit of time with some meaningful requirements on clock synchronization, I, I personally would support. Um, another kind of regulation would just be little pushes to help the market fix itself. Um, and for example, proactively clarifying that market design innovation is welcome would be a good step. The, the pissing match over IEX's exchange application was massive and I think ends up putting this implicit regulatory shadow on um, uh, on innovation. I mean, IEX had to raise like 100 million bucks to launch, for example, and I don't have 100 million bucks. Um, the political economy of regulation, uh, of regulatory reform isn't great in this uh, context uh, either. And, and the, the basic reason is it's an issue of concentrated uh, benefits dispersed, or concentrated harm dispersed benefits, right? Exchanges and high frequency trading firms have a lot to lose from um, from departure from the status quo, whereas the benefits from departing from the status quo are a lot more dispersed, kind of market health, uh, market health more broadly. Um, and this makes the political economy of regulatory reform a bit tricky. Okay. So, so where are we? I mean, I, I think we identified a pretty simple market failure. It strikes at the core of how we think efficient markets are supposed to work. It causes a massive industrial arms race, harms investors, makes markets unnecessarily complicated. It's probably $100 billion or more of net present value. A pretty reasonable solution from economics, very simple. Um, 
the case for market forces fixing the failure is not like completely pessimistic, but it's not overwhelming. It's not like the New York Stock Exchange called me up after the paper came out and said, hey, let's, let's do your thing. Um, and the political economy for the regulator to fix the market also isn't, isn't fantastic. So a question I think a lot about a lot is you know, what, to, what to do about this. Um, and and I, wanna, I think this work's important. I, I don't want to uh, underplay that, but this is, I think, an example of a larger phenomenon, which is when academics come up with, social, with ideas that are socially useful, but not, private, not, not privately profitable. Um, and sometimes quite the opposite of privately profitable, actually antagonistic to concentrated private interests. So carbon taxes are probably the most uh, socially important example of this of this dynamic um, uh, at the moment. I have two, kind of two thoughts I'd like to, to end with. Um, you know, one is this great Milton Friedman quote, um, you know, the enormous inertia, tyranny of the status quo. And my, my favorite part of this quote is when he talks about what our role is as academics, which is to keep doing the work, keep good ideas alive until there's a, a moment of opportunity to, uh, to change policy or change uh, change practice. And that, I think, speaks to just like, you know, keep doing the work. There's plenty more to do. Keep, you know, keep doing empirical analysis. I've got this project underway with the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK where we're using new kinds of data to measure latency arbitrage. Uh, more precisely, the I.O. paper, the work with uh, Peter and David Parks and others that I mentioned. Um, and then my second thought's kind of more of a question for the profession. I think it's particularly salient for this interface between economics and computer science, which is that whether there are institutions we can build within academia that help push our good ideas uh, out into practical use. And I think, you know, Al, Al Roth, um, sorry, uh, Al Roth, my, my dissertation advisor, wrote this famous paper called The Economist is Engineer, that we need to foster a new kind of literature within economics that's akin to the relationship between engineering uh, and physics that helps us build a bridge from theoretical ideas to practice. Uh, my colleague Luigi Zingales talked about the, the importance of us getting more involved in the details of policy debates. And you know, in a rigorously informed, academically disciplined way, but engaged in policy. Um, and I think what, what Roth and Zingales are talking about seems especially you know, I, think, I think of them as talking about the gap between theory and practice, the gap between what we naturally do in our academic work and what, the kind of work we have to do to get, get good ideas um, implemented um, in, in, in the world. And I think these, the, the, these gaps are especially salient for research ideas where there's tension between social interests and and private interests, and when there's tension between concentrated, uh, concentrated interests and, and dispersed, uh, dispersed interests. I mean, as a relatively young researcher, then untenured, I got thrust into a pretty high stakes, emotionally charged, fast moving debate. And you know, at times it was like me against the HFT lobby, and that's, you know, I was kind of outgunned. Um, but I, you know, I had good talking points. I don't, I'm not trying to be too mean and hard on myself. But when, when social value and private value are aligned, natural economic forces help build bridges from good ideas from academia uh, uh, into practice. There are numerous ideas from finance, numerous examples from finance. There are many, many ideas from computer science. And it's not automatic or without serious effort, but at least economic forces, you know, the, the winds are at our back. Um, but when, when social value is positive, but private, concentrated private interests are opposed, then not only is there not this magnet pulling our ideas out of, out of the academy into practice, but there's kind of the opposite. There's active opposition. Um, and, and, you know, in the end, I'm an optimist. I think eventually good ideas win. I, I'll, I'll bet anyone in the room that we'll have discrete time trading within the next, say, decade. Um, but I kind of wonder what, what we can do to speed up. High-frequency trading firms are spending billions of dollars on billions of seconds. You know, what, what can we do to, to do, a little bit, uh, do a little bit better? Let me end on that somber note. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time.
I heard clapping from there. <laughs> um, I mean, oh, I think I know who the clapping was from. Um, okay, so I think, let me tell you what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I think I'm confident in from our research is that there are large gains without identifiable costs of going from continuous serial to discrete batch when the discrete batch interval is, is short. I think our research, doesn't, our, our research doesn't shed light on the further costs and benefits of going from, say, a millisecond or a tenth of a second to you know, th those kinds of intervals, which we talk about in length in the paper, uh, to intervals more like once a day. I think partly, I, my, I suspect part of the answer comes from interrelationships among assets, so tra investors that are engaged in portfolio decision, you know, buy some A, sell some B, hedging with options, engaged in transactions across multiple different kinds of assets. And then continuous markets become like a substitute for combinatorial markets. That's a, a research idea that I'd love to find a way to formalize. But, um, so that's one kind of instinct. But the, I think the, the more honest answer is there are costs and benefits, and we don't have a rich understanding of what the real costs would be of going from a millisecond to 10 minutes. I think we can give a tight answer that going from continuous time to a millisecond would be good for markets without identifiable costs. Okay. Uh, th thank you. It was a great talk. Yeah. And I have a bunch of questions and, and thoughts, but I'll, I'll try to pick one. Uh, would you give a similar? What would happen if instead of discrete time, you did just that you said you could cancel, you know, and cancel takes priority, and you have like a few milliseconds to cancel your order? Oh, so I, I, I had this one slide where I said there's lots of ideas floating around. Right. I think there's one idea. I think it's like sort of informed by our research. That's a good idea, um, which is an, an asymmetric delay in how orders are processed. So in particular. Uh, liquidity providing orders are, provi are processed automatically. Liquidity canceling orders are processed automatically. Orders that would execute um, are given some tiny delay. And the Chicago Stock Exchange, a small incumbent exchange so with like, negligible market share without large revenues from co-location and data, actually proposed to do just that. I, was in, I had no formal relationship with them. I should have emphasized I have no financial involvement in this debate. I have no financial ties to anybody. I've talked to a lot of stakeholders, but I'm, I'm independent and objective. But I talked to them about what they were proposing. I think it was a good idea. It got vehemently opposed. You should read Citadel's comment letters if you're interested in a good time. Uh, and it, it ultimately got blocked. And then they got acquired by the New York Stock Exchange. So what the New York Stock Exchange is going to do with them is, is be uh, over my pay grade. But, um, but I, I think that's a good idea. I think there are advantages to frequent batch auctions over that idea. We talk about that in the paper, but that's one of the ideas I think is quite a good one. Okay, I'm afraid we have to stop here, but there is a room, so don't forget yeah, to